Most of you are buying chairs because you have back pain of some sort, you've been sitting too long, and your chair is basically killing you. And today I thought I'd do something a little different. Today, let's talk about the science of seating. And to that end, we have somebody who is infinitely more qualified than I am, one of the finest back pain experts of our generation, and that is Dr. Stuart McGill from Canada. I could tell you that the man is one of the most eminent spine professors of our generation, but I guess you can read his 129 page CV on your own. I first reached out to Dr. McGill after talking to Secret Lab, which agreed to sponsor a Secret Lab Titan Evo 2022. Thank you for sponsoring this video. And so he's going to be talking to us on a fundamental level about how seating works and how we can preserve our posture. So let's take it away and welcome Dr. McGill. So like, how's the chair so far? I like it. It is my preferred chair for uh, watching the television. Obviously, I'm talking to you now. Uh, chairs are task specific. In other words, if I was sitting at my computer, sitting upright and typing, I would choose an office task chair. But when I'm in a more casual setting, I much prefer this chair. And if I was to read a book or to watch the television, this would be my uh, chair of choice. So there's a start. Now, there are some certain scientific and uh, principles and laws of biology the shape that kind of an answer and uh, mm. if you wish we could discuss it. Would you say that gaming chairs are generally suited for a work environment or do you think that they can be made suitable for a work environment? To answer that, you're asking me a very general question. Right. So I have to start with a general answer and I try and stay within my field of having a logical and a scientific foundation. If I may describe some of the scientific principles that guide a person's decision on what they think about a chair. That would be great. Yes, if you would please. Oh, okay. All right. Well, the first concept is one of joint equilibrium, as we call it. So if you could take my elbow joint, and if, if I was anesthetized or I could fall into a swimming pool without gravity, my body joints would fall into a position of minimal stress. So my elbow, for example, uh, if I can find that magic angle of zero stress, that's where the flexor stresses equal the extensor stresses, and that is elastic equilibrium. By definition, that's the least loaded position for the joint, the most restful. So if I was to extend my elbow, I would create flexor stress. And if I was to go back to the, the neutral area, shall we say, or elastic equilibrium, and I flex my elbow, I then create extensor stress. Right. Well, an elbow joint is a hinge joint. It doesn't have much stress until I go to the extreme. So when I extremely extend my elbow, there are bones that create a mechanical stop. And if I were to push that eventually, and that's what jujitsu would be, or an arm bar, you would actually break the elbow. Uh, either some of the ligaments or, or some of the bony stops. So that's the next principle. Elastic equilibrium defines the least loaded position. And then posture change migrates stress from one tissue to another. And the biological principle of less pain and less injury is to stay away from the postures that migrate stress onto vulnerable tissues. So there's a little bit of an introduction to the concept through an elbow. Then we can look at a spine. A spine isn't hinge joints or ball and socket joints. They're blocks of vertebra with discs in, in between. And there's a much wider zone of elastic equilibrium. But when you get to the end range, you migrate stress onto different tissues. I have never created or seen evidence for an injury from just sitting if the person has no pre-existing conditions. So you can't really damage your spine sitting. However, if you have a pre-existing disc bulge or you're on your way to creating a disc bulge mm -hmm. so that the collagen of the annulus, the, the fibers that make up the joint of the disc and the spine, if they have some pre-existing delamination from excessive loading, but it wouldn't have been from sitting. It would have been from something else, lifting inappropriately, too much load, too much motion or whatever. Then sitting, well, it can actually increase the size of the disc bulge. That would be considered an injury. So there's the second general concept. Now here's the third general concept that 
we need to get through to discuss seating comfort and risk versus reward and all the rest of it. And it's this, it's a discussion of the importance of posture, but it's a posture over time. Let's take laying in bed. Now, People will think, well, laying in bed would never cause an injury, but let me paint that picture and story for you. If you lay in bed and you never change your position, you will get a little bit of discomfort, maybe over the hip joints, over the shoulders or in your back or wherever. If you don't change your posture and if you ignore those warning signals of discomfort, that discomfort eventually turns to pain if you don't change your posture. If you keep laying in bed and you ignore the pain, you will then develop bed sores, which Which is is a breakdown of the tissue and the tissue actually creates a bed sore. It becomes ischemic, lack of blood supply, and you will have an open bed sore. So that's showing you how even posture over a length of time, if you don't change it, creates a stress concentration and actual tissue damage and injury. So there are people who sit in wheelchairs, for example, who don't change posture. And if the person who sets up and designs the wheelchair doesn't alleviate those stress concentrations, eventually that poor person is going to suffer an injury, which is a sore from sitting. That's the extreme only to demonstrate the principle. So now we can have a general discussion to start about the ergonomics of seating. And then you got very specific and went into gaming chairs. What's the ideal sitting posture? Well, given the science that I just described, one does not exist forever. So the way to mitigate that is to foster posture change. So there are some people who get, let's go to one end of the spectrum of task chairs. Let's start with an office ergonomic chair. There are people who say, well, I'm going to set up my office chair in the ideal position and don't ever change that. That's the ideal position for me. And yet the science (laughs) shows the ideal posture is one that migrates from one position to another to migrate the stress from one tissue. Mm -hmm. Uh, But once it starts building up a bit of a stress concentration, it's biologically justifiable to change position. So the very best ergonomic office chairs are ones that allow you to perform the task, which is usually operating a computer, allows you to change postures. In other words, change the settings, which some people uh, have a little bit of a difficult time with. But if I said to you, what would be the best sitting position to read a book? Again, it depends on you as an individual. If we did an assessment and we asked you to slump in a chair, straighten one knee and look down. Now, if that caused your back pain, if you sat in a chair looking down at a book and put your feet up on a stool, you would see that you just mimicked the posture that caused your particular pain mechanism. The next person, it doesn't matter. It's not their pain mechanism. Or someone else's pain, you could ask them to stand up and extend your back and then drop one shoulder back. So now you could see that if they laid back in a gaming chair and had too much lumbar support, that would be putting them into a position that exacerbates their particular pain mechanism. So yet again, we see we're matching with adjustability that person's posture away from their pain. And we're starting to converge on now a set of postures that we can migrate between and not trigger their pain. So getting back to the Evo chair, which I've been now sitting in for uh, about a month, I can sit back and I can open up my hips. So what I'm going to do now, and I don't know if you wanna get into this specific discussion here or not, but with the change with the lever of the angle of the seat pan and the seat back, I can open up my hips. Well, there are some people who, when the knees are together, they get a stress in the front of their hip. So the way to alleviate that stress in the front of their hip is to open up the hip joint, but that now changes the stress migration in my spine. And if sitting slouched causes my pain, you see, I now have a problem. However, with this particular gaming chair, I can spread my knees apart. I've taken away the hip stress, and now I can change the posture of my spine and take advantage of the beautiful lumbar support and migrate stress away from uh, the particular pain triggers or mechanisms in that individual. So I'm getting right back to understanding 
what your discomfort or your pain triggers are, or in some unfortunates, what their injury mechanism is. Now you can use the chair with those scientific guidelines to migrate the stress away from the mechanism. But for reading a book, I don't want to sit upright in a, an office task chair if I'm going to watch the television. To sit upright migrates stress. I want to get away from that. So do you see why this gaming chair is the best of all worlds when I'm performing tasks like reading a book? Now, I might, again, if I have a history with uh, neck issues, I might put my book on this uh, holder and hold that in front of me like that. Now I can read the, the book or watch the television, basically stress-free. I've migrated the stress concentrations. At a good angle, uh, got it. At, at, a, at a good angle with posture right. change. So look at what I can do. Mm -hmm. I can adjust my neck posture very easily. I can adjust my lumbar posture. I can change the hip angle, which I've just shown you affects stress in the sciatic nerve. If the person suffered from sciatica down the back of my leg, I've changed my hip stress, I've changed my spine stress. So I'm now able to converge on a th not only a scientifically determined pain-free, stress-free posture, but one that I can feel as well. But at the end of the day, I'm still sitting. And it doesn't matter what chair you're in, at the end of the day, you're still wiser if you're following the principles of, of biology for good health is you've got to get out of the chair, go for a walk. There's no chair on earth that you can sit in for 12 hours. Okay. So maybe if you could speak to, I guess, like whether you could imagine yourself working, let's say in the Titan Evil. Well, I, uh, am I working now, Victor? Work is like basically almost any activity, right? Like it's... It, exactly. Like, so my, yeah. my, my point is you, you've asked me for opinions based on the science that we've uh, performed and uh, some of the issues that we've investigated. So if I'm giving you my uh, opinions, this is work for me. I see. So my, my, okay. my point is I'm working right now. You're not paying me enough, but uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm kidding. But my point is, I, I, just to be very transparent about that, there's no money exchanged here. This is, uh, but work is fun too. So I'm having fun. I am working, but uh, I'm sitting in a very comfortable, uh, basically stress-free situation right now. Now I'm, I'm going to sit and talk to you for uh, a few more minutes and that is fine. Then it will be time for me to get up, go for a short walk, migrate the stress away from the tissues that have been building up a concentration. Mm -hmm. I've optimized my health. I've done a bit of work. Got and, it. Uh, life is rosy. Would you recommend maybe this chair to people who are trying to address back pain, perhaps? So when a patient, I mean, obviously, I, I still see patients. And uh, they're quite often asking me, what chair should I buy? I usually recommend uh, a couple because a office task chair might be the best for setting up uh, to work at a desk, but it's not the best for watching the television, uh, playing computer games, uh, reading a book, uh, having a conversation like I'm having a, with you now. I, I don't need to use my hands and uh, type on a keyboard. So I would recommend this chair for those tasks. Okay. Now, I also know some people who I've recommended the chair to, they do use it at their desk, but what they do is adjust it now. They raise the height of the seat pan with the pneumatic cylinder. They bring up the angle uh, between the seat pan and the seat back. That allows them to sit more upright, closer to their work. They may adjust the armrests. So I have my armrests very high right now. And if I was to hold the book, uh, it's, it's a stress-free way to hold the book. Now, if I lowered them and I looked down, and if that was a pain trigger for me, walking around with my neck in this posture, then you see I would be instigating the, the conditions that contributed to the pain. I can mitigate them by having my arm up and bringing what I'm reading up to this position. Or I might put the thing I'm reading into a document holder, as an example. At some point in the day, I would then go and have a, a nice exercise routine and build up some resilience. So do you see, it's, it's a little bit of a, a multifaceted approach to optimize your general health and sitting will be a part of that. You know, it's very interesting, Victor, when you look at the work data and prevalence of back pain and neck pain and whatnot. So in other words, the rest position is the opposite 
of the mechanical demands of the work. So if their work is sitting, do you think they should sit on their rest break? No, the rest break should be exercise, something very dynamic. It's the polar opposite. But if they have a very demanding job, say they are a construction worker, a farmer, a fisherman, a carpenter, what's their rest break position? Sit down. But you should not do one of those throughout the day. I see. Yeah. So, so the, the, the secret to the, the health optimization is keep migrating between stresses. Okay. So now you have to survey your life a little bit. I get too many young people as patients who will sit and they will play a video game for hours and then we will test them and we will find out what causes their pain. And you can imagine that it's sitting. <laughs> so if uh, they say, well, doc, what can I do for my uh, back pain? And I say, well, we've just shown you what your pain triggers are at sitting. What do you think it is now? And they say, well, don't sit so much. And I said, precisely. <laughs> but no, no, no doc has told them that before. So to remove the cause is the first job of uh, any clinician, patient or client relationship. Know the mechanism. Once the person becomes savvy to that, they uh, now have a little bit of a roadmap on, on what to do. But if they're an addict of uh, gaming, now we have a problem. We have an addiction problem, and that is part of the drivers of their pain. And I would also suggest that not only is it an issue of their spine, it will be uh, issues elsewhere. Uh, when I look at an MRI, which is a medical image of the person's insides. So it's not like an x-ray, which just shows bone. It shows all of the organs, the vascular structures, the spine, etc. It's concerning to me when I will see a young person who's in the gaming world and I'm looking at their spine and then I see their descending aorta, which is the major vessel exiting their heart. And it goes right down the front of their spine. And I see there's a white ring inside it where they've built up arterial plaque through oh, inactivity. Yeah. Yes. And I see all of this and I'm a spine expert. So I talk about their spines and sometimes I uh, will point out to them and say, you know, you're headed in the wrong direction here. If you want to be a happy grandfather. I mean, I don't know like the statistics for like how long esports players sit down every single day, but I mean, I guess it is something that you have to just constantly do train and basically just sit down every single day for long periods of time. And like, the thing is that like, even if you do sit down, chances are that you won't end up getting like the ergonomic benefit of the chair because like uh, very frequently, and I learned this from speaking also to Dr. Tai, I'm not sure if you guys have met already. Uh, he was talking about how like, you know, when a lot of esports players, they play games essentially what happens is that they just lean forward and they just like look intently at the screen you know and it's definitely concerning right there my real subspecialty is uh to work with athletes when you consider who are athletes and really it's everyone you're conditioning your body to perform the tasks that you give it but still right. be ready for those situations in life where you're going to have to act physically and if you're disabled because of your inactivity, you won't be able to respond. You will suffer. But I think of some athletes, one just came to mind in particular, who was a poker player, a very well-known poker player in the world. Now, they would get into a poker game and it would be televised and millions of dollars at stake. They would need to sit hours upon hours but his back pain became so intense, it was inhibiting him to be an athletic poker player. In other words, he couldn't meet the demands of world-class poker because of his back pain. So that's, a, that's an athletic challenge. So we had to design a program to settle his back down and then build up a capacity to sit for hours at a time to get through the poker game. So there's a whole new take on building your body for athleticism and resilience, no matter what you do. But how you would build a poker player is very different on how you would build a weightlifter or a soccer player or a dancer, or a gymnast or anyone else. But they're all athletes in terms of they have to meet the demands of their occupation or the love of their life or, or whatever it happens to be. Okay, maybe I can ask um, a question since you're actually sitting on the chair right now, because like this is a question that a lot of people have uh, when they think about like say the lumbar support on the EVO 2022. Let's say that you are looking to decide how you should adjust 
this chair to suit your individual needs. How would you maybe do so in a way that would be, let's say, consistent with what the science suggests that you should do in order to migrate uh, stress from your back in the optimal way? Of course, it's something that does involve like some adjustment of position like throughout the course of the day. But, you know, if you're just casually just sitting down for like the first time, then how would you adjust that? Would you just adjust it based on the degree of comfort that you feel while sitting in the chair? Or is there maybe something else that you should pay attention to? Well, how I would do it and how a member of the lay public would do it would be two very different things. How I would do it, I would work with that person. I would have them slouch and sit up and I would see how they extend their spine and uh, flex their hips to sit upright. And I would determine if they are hip dominant in uh, creating that postural correction or spine dominant. And I would see where the pain triggers are because everyone comes to me with back pain. That's the only reason someone would come to me. So if they are hip dominant, I would have the lumbar support lower to drive the top of their pelvis forward and their spine aligns and de-stresses for free. So pardon the language, but I would say position the lumbar support as low as you can so that the bottom of the support is close to the top of your butt crack. Um, it's called the gluteal fold <laughs> <laughs> to be a bit more anatomic, but okay. no one knows what I'm talking about. So the, no, the, the one we lower. Okay, so the, the <laughs> position it at the top of your butt crack. But if they are more of a uh, chest lifter, they may get more comfort and benefit from raising the uh, lumbar support. So there's uh, what I would do in terms of guiding that person as to the strategy. But most people, very few have access to me. So how do they do it? What I would suggest, if you had an Evo as an example, which allows the lumbar support to move up and down the spine with a turn mechanism, and it allows to it allows it to increase and decrease the amount of support with the other control. What I would do is decrease the lumbar protrusion from the chair or the inflation, whatever you want to call it. And then I would move the support to its lowest position. And then I would start to increase the amount of support a little bit so you can feel it in your back. Then try moving it up your back and seeing if you're, so we're, we're, this is what we call bracketing. So then move it up a little bit higher and you say, oh, no, no, that's definitely too high. I can feel that. Then go halfway between the two. Oh, no, I still want it a bit lower. Good, go halfway between those two. So you're bracketing and converging on the vertical height of the support. But as I said, start with the pad close to the top of your butt crack. Now, do the same bracketing with the amount of support that you're dialing in increase it. And then you'll say, oh, no, that's too much. Good. Decrease it. No, that's too little. So now you converge not only up and down, but you converge on the amount of support. Now, here's the funny thing about that. Mm -hmm. This will change throughout the day. So people will think, oh, someone come and adjusted my chair while I was away. Well, not really. When you go to bed at night, your discs in your spine are what are called hydrophilic. They love water. They suck up fluids throughout the day. So you know you're taller when you get out of bed in the morning than when you went to bed at night. Now, think of a water balloon. You can fill a balloon with water. And the more water that you fill it with, the more turgid or stiff the balloon becomes. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the phenomenon that occurs in your disc. So when you wake up in the morning, you know, you remember how easy it was to take your socks off before you got into bed. But it's a little more difficult to put your socks on first thing in the morning because of the extra fluid, so to speak, that has plumped up uh, your discs. So when you first sit in your Evo, first thing in the morning, your spine won't want very much inflation. Back off the amount of support, first thing. And then you will find about an hour later, you will want a little bit more inflation or support. I'm using inflation as a word to describe the amount of support that you're getting. So my point is, you can use a bracketing procedure to find the location, realizing that there will be some days where you want, won't want as much support and other days where you will want a little bit more. I see. And in most of those situations, would you say that comfort would be a good guide? Or, I mean, is there something else? Yes. If, if, if you're the average person without any pain triggers, let comfort be your guide. 
But if you have specific pain triggers, for example, people are familiar mm -hmm. with the term sciatica. So pain comes from either tensioning or migration of the sciatic nerve, which comes out of the back, goes behind the hip, behind the knee, and uh, down the leg, as an example. So if you have sciatica, you will adjust the lumbar posture to minimize the sciatica. So it's not only comfort anymore, it might be actual pain. I see. Um, if you have hip pain, change the posture away from the pain. If you have low back pain, so do you see what I mean? Pain mitigates what the strategy should be to uh, so you... set up the posture and the it's lumbar uh, support. Mm -hmm. Even the position of my arms, it's the position of my neck, which determines the, the, the tension of the nerves down the, the rest of my back and, and hips and legs. The seat pan to seat back angle, which we adjust. The seat height is important. If it's too high, I get pressure behind my knees because my feet are dangling off the floor. And another important measure that I just might bring up at this time is the length of the seat pan. So I'm sitting in a seat pan now. And when you go to the Evo website, there are different sizes of seats. And I might recommend that they actually give the length of the seat pan. That would be helpful because I happen to have very long femurs and it's perfect for me that the length of this seat pan equals the length of the distance behind my knee to the back of my pelvis. If the seat pan was too long, I couldn't move my back properly to the backrest and I would not be able to take advantage of the support. So I scoot my, my pelvis back and I can take full advantage of the support, but a person with a shorter femur would not. So I think it's important to know the length between your sitting behind the knee to the back of your pelvis and then match that to the length of the seat pan when you're ordering the chair. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in the technical specifications. So like you can actually find those on the Secret Lab website, but uh, not a lot of people can. You, you, you can, but the people would be better instructed if they knew what their femur length is. You could have three different people. What I do is I measure their height when they're standing. So tallest on the left, shortest on the right mm -hmm. and then I have them sit down and you'll see the order changes the tallest is now maybe number six in the line in other words what you're measuring is their torso length to their leg length and just because you're 511 tall or 1.8 meters or however you measure your height the leg length could be quite a variable so it's right. more important to measure the leg length to get that particular fitting of the chair which allows you to take full advantage of all of the adjustability in the chair that's absolutely true. Do you have any, I guess, like specific comments on the gaming chair industry? I guess like now that you've experienced this chair for the first time, do you have any like comments on how you see that uh, maybe like this industry might change uh, over the course of time? Because it seems that, you know, the industry is moving more towards like, you know, ergonomic seat comfort type thing. Like you do have like, not just uh, the Secret Lab Titan, you do also have like the Razer Isker, which uh, also does market itself for example, as an ergonomic gaming chair. Do you feel that this trend is going to be something that will continue, I guess, like in days to come? Yeah, it could be also that your comments might be guided by some of the comments that maybe Secret Lab had also sent out essentially in that document. Yeah, I understand, Victor. You don't want to ask Stu for business advice. I'm the world's worst businessman. <laughs> so That's fine. My, my, yeah, my, my expertise is in the science side of things and uh, I'm comfortable there but uh, I'm not the person to ask on uh, future business trends. <laughs> okay, that's fair. So th thank you so much again. Uh... Oh, my, my pleasure, Victor. And uh, thanks for arranging uh, this. I'm quite enjoying this chair. And as I said, I've uh, sold a few for you. It was, it was a, a really interesting experience when uh, it came to the door and I uh, put it together. There really has been good thought given to making it a very sort of cool and attractive chair and a cool and attractive process to put it together. The way it's laid out in the box and the toolkit you get, uh, it's, it was a bit of fun actually. Wow, okay. So like, um, did it make you in any way want to play your very first video game? No. No, <laughs> uh, that's fine. <laughs> I'm uh, very much a proponent of enjoying real life, not a virtual life. <laughs> that is fair. Yeah.
Although some might say that life itself is the true game. Ah. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Okay. Most welcome. All right. Cheers. Cheers.